What's up, people? How you doing? So this is my first Wednesday walk through scripture. Uh, it's going to be a little longer than normal. I have to lay out some some foundation before we get into this and some some reminders for us, as well as some explanation uh, when it comes to diving into the Word of God. Um, because remember, the biggest thing we have to to understand when we're looking at God's Word is context. Context, context, context. There are countless teachers out there, as well as immature believers, who like to take the Word of God and interpret it as they see fit. There are reasons that there are thousands of denominations in our country. It's because people split as they like, as they define the gospel the way they want to define it. A great example of this is the Baptist uh, conference, where there have been more, over there, there have been more than four hundred different splits, forming four hundred different branches of Baptists. I mean, even in the congregational denomination, which is one of the oldest Protestant Reformed denominations, we've had four splits over the centuries, with three of the splits leaving the authority of God's word behind as they reinterpret it how they want to based on the culture. So needless to say, context is vital when we're looking at the word of God. The apostle makes it clear in his letter to, to Titus in the very first chapter concerning elders and teachers of the word, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it for there are many who are insubordinate insubordinate empty talkers and deceivers especially those of the circumcision party they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful game what they ought not to teach i mean paul here in his letters when you when you see false teachers even when you hear Jesus talking about it, they're all under the guise of being followers of Jesus or followers of God. And they're teaching false things that are causing people to stray. And there's a reason Paul makes it clear in Galatians chapter 1. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting, deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Remember, these false teachers are coming under the guise of being teachers of the word of God. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And what was Paul preaching? What was the gospel that Paul was preaching? Well, he lets you know in his first letter to the church in Corinth in chapter 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all Paul preached was Jesus and him crucified. And he was doing this before the New Testament was written. And the sources he was using to do this was the Old Testament. All of the Old Testament points to Jesus it all points to God's redemptive plan because all the scriptures point to God's redemptive plan. All of the Old Testament pointed to what God was going to do, which all came to fruition in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's plan was fulfilled when Jesus drank in the full wrath of God in our place on the cross as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He died in our place. But he didn't stay dead, because three days later, he rose from the grave, conquering death. So as we dive into Genesis chapter 1 and 2, um, let's look at how God's plan of redemption starts unfolding. Because that's exactly what's happening in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. As we're getting ready to dive in, hopefully over the last few days, you've joined in on the challenge of reading chapters 1 and 2 here. As I said, Saturday... The context of this is the Israelites have been rescued from the oppression under the Egyptian pharaoh, under the Egyptian empire. They had been in, in Egypt, as Exodus chapter 12 makes clear, for 430 years. And God was fulfilling the promise he made to Jacob 
back in chapter 46 of Genesis, where the Lord said to Jacob, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you into Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. So that right there is part of the context of what we see going on in, in all of Genesis. The Lord is fulfilling the promises of old. He's fulfilling his plan of redemption. And right here, with them coming out, he's keeping his promise that he made to Jacob by bringing him, his descendants, out of Egypt, back into the land that he had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Another part of the context of this is that the Israelites who were now out of Egypt had been in a culture where countless false gods are worshipped, where countless false gods are taught about. And as we walk through Genesis, we're going to see real quick that it is really easy to take our eyes off the Lord and focus on what is around us instead of following God. The Israelites had been in a culture for centuries where there was idol worship everywhere. And they had been influenced by this idol worship, which is a side note, should, should cause each and every one of us to consider what idols of our culture have influenced us, making it hard for us to love the Lord our God with all of our mind, heart, soul, and strength. Think about media. Think about online content like Facebook or Twitter or some of these things. Think about workplaces and, and schools and what they're teaching. What around us, what idols around us are making it hard to love the Lord our God with all, all of our mind, heart, soul, and strength? Because just like the Israelites coming out of Egypt, we have the same stuff in our culture. We have the same stuff in cultures all around the world. We're being discipled by someone or something. And, well, the, these Israelites had been discipled. The evidence of this, or one of the evidences of this, is... Uh, comes with the golden calf incident in Exodus chapter 32 where Moses had been up the mountain too long. The Israelites thought he was dead and so they peer pressure Aaron into making this this golden calf. And then they have the audacity to, gall, to call the golden calf by the Lord's personal name, Yahweh. You know, the problem with false religions under the guise of being Christian is that they're doing the same thing today. They're allowing the culture around them to influence them, to, to interpret the scripture. And they've created these false religions under the guise of being followers of Jesus. You know, think about the golden calf. This golden calf was either created in the image of the false god Hathor, who was, who was um, the god of motherhood, or it was created after the false god Apis, who is allegedly the son of Hathor, who is in the form of a bull. Apis was the god of strength and courage, which is why I tend to think it's Apis that they, that they created here. Um, because think about it, the Israelites had just come out of Egypt. They just escaped Egypt, watching the Lord decimate the Egyptian army that had been following them. Strength and courage. We all know, if you've read Exodus, that the Golden Calf incident didn't go that well because 3,000 people ended up dying that day as a result of it. Remember, the second or the first and second commandments found uh, initially in Exodus chapter 20 are, are vital. God starts off those commandments saying this, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I am the Lord your God. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Like God is jealous. He doesn't want us worshiping false gods. He doesn't want us worshiping anything but him. He's a jealous God. But he goes on, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Interesting. So while the Israelites hadn't yet received the commandments, God was making it clear. And they were breaking the first two commandments and making that golden calf. And worse, they gave it 
the name Yahweh. This is the proper context of Genesis. The Israelites had been freed from bondage in Egypt, and God was showing them how he was fulfilling his plan of redemption. The, the thing is, though, that God was also showing them how everything else came into being. Because under the Egyptians, they, they had heard different stories when it came to the creation account. Think about it. All of the Egyptian gods represented a different aspect of creation. Each culture had its own creation account. Interestingly enough, each culture back then also had their own flood accounts. These accounts can easily be found in red. I, I personally have a couple of them in some ancient documents in my office. And God here with Genesis wants to show the Israelites, as well as you and me, how it all started. This is why we have Genesis. Specifically, it's why we have Genesis 1 through 10. Remember, all cultures had a flood account. And the Lord, in chapters 1 through 10 of Genesis, was showing the Israelites how everything came into being. Even the name of the book, Genesis, shows us. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Even the name of the book literally translates, in the beginning, the first three words of Genesis. As a side note, in Matthew's account of Jesus' birth after the genealogy, down in verse 18, we read, Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. That third word, birth, in the Greek is the Greek word genesis. Genesis. It's the only time in the New Testament that I've found so far, and I, I've looked, where that specific Greek word is used. And it's used symbolically showing us that God is remaking everything through Jesus, which is wicked awesome. But Genesis, in the beginning, is how the Lord decides to open up his word to his people. God wants to show them how it all started. He wanted to show them how his plan of redemption had been unfolding from before the creation of even them, before the creation of everything. This is critical. God was showing them how he did it. And when the Israelites heard this, they weren't thinking, oh, that's interesting. The world is about 2,600 years old. Which if you do the math, um, you come to when the Israelites start making their way out into the wilderness. The Israelites there, though, when they were hearing this, weren't doing quick math to figure out how old the earth was. They weren't. There wasn't a debate as to how old the earth was. God's intention wasn't for them to figure out how old the earth was. If you want to argue that, Paul makes it pretty clear in Titus chapter 3. To avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, those you find in the word of God, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. The law, you know, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. The Lord's intentions weren't to debate the age of the earth. Instead, God was showing them that he did it. And he was showing them how he did it. He first created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit was hovering over the face of the deep. Notice right there, he didn't speak. That, that, that's important because it's coming up. Then after he created this, he spoke. Let there be light. The very word of God. And as we know from John chapter 1, where it starts with, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We know what the Word of God is, but, Genesis, or, but John 1 goes even further. Uh, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Ha! John chapter 1 opens up, pointing back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It's amazing. It's all about Jesus, the, the light of the world. Think about it. In the very first chapter of Genesis, in the very first verse, we see the triune God at work. God the Father, the author of all creation. God the Son, the active agent in creation. 
and God, the Holy Spirit, the one who gives life. It's a beautiful realization of God's redemptive plan from the beginning. Then on the next day, uh, on day two, and, and remember the purpose of this was not to debate whether it was a literal day or not. God was actually showing them something pertaining to the Sabbath that he was going to teach them about very soon. But on the next day, God separated the waters. Then on the next day, he gathered the waters in certain spots so that dry land appeared. And on the dry land, he created vegetation. And all through this, he is speaking. Remember, I've already said it. Jesus is the active agent in creation. He's the very word of God in the flesh. Then, on the fourth day, the sun, the moon, the stars are coming into being. Which means the light on the first three days was from himself. It was Jesus, the light of the world. Think about it. It's pretty cool. On the fifth day, though, we see, we see birds and, and, and fish come into being. And on the sixth day, we see all the animals of the earth come into being, leading to the Lord saying, let us make man in our image. And here, after he makes man, we get the second and third command that he gave to man. We're going to get to the uh, first command he gave to man uh, shortly in chapter 2. But he gives the second and third command here where he tells Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, which means have sex and have children. Sex is a command from God in the confines of marriage. Um, and on top of that, the Lord tells us, or tells Adam and Eve to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the ground, even the serpent. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, there's even more evidence, though, uh, of God's provision here. I have given every green plant for food. So all my vegan friends, you see here that initially we were all vegans just like you. Meat comes into the picture later, way later. And chapter one ends with God making it known that with each day, things were good. And that when he had finished creating everything... It was very good. And chapter 2 opens with the seventh day, where God rested, making the seventh day holy. Here's where we have to remind ourselves. Context, context, context. The Israelites are hearing this for the first time after being in bondage for 430 years, where for a majority of that time they were slaves. They were slaves who were forced to work daily. They were tired. They had no clue what a day of rest was. And the Lord is making it clear that he worked for six days. And on the seventh, he rested as an example for us. We know that God doesn't need to rest. He is the Lord of all. Yet, we need to ground ourselves in in him. We need to rest in him. And in the later writings of Moses, the Lord lays out what that will look like, as well as what are the penalties for not resting in him. The beauty that we see here of this seventh day, though, is that man was created on the sixth day. And we see here on the seventh day was a holy day of rest. So man's created on the sixth day and his first full day of existence was resting in the Lord. What we're seeing here is God works and then rests. We're talking about eternal rest now. We're talking about after the recreation of everything, after Revelation 1, where, where God is at rest and it's done, it is finished. Um, so God works and then rests. We rest in the Lord to work. It's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to grasp, especially in the context of what God is showing them concerning the Sabbath in the law, also known as the writings of Moses. Remember, they were slaves for generations, for centuries. They don't know this stuff about resting in the Lord. We've heard about it, and we still don't do this stuff. 
then God goes on in chapter 2. And starting in verse 4, we get something that I need to do a little more Hebrew work when I get back to Ohio and I'm able to sit down at my desk with, my, with all my stuff. But we get this verse. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, on the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. I need to do some work with that Hebrew word right there because was it generations that took place throughout the first six days? Or, well, there are many arguments that people like to do right now. and We're supposed to stay away from foolish genealogies and controversies and stuff about the law. Which is why we have to remember that, that is not the point of what God is trying to show them or us here in Genesis 1 and 2. He's showing the Israelites how he did it so that they understand who he is. He's the creator of all. He's the author of all creation. And so in chapter 2, the Lord digs a little deeper concerning the creation of man. We see that the creation of Eden uh, is here in the midst of of the creation of everything that Lord is our, the Lord has already done. First, though, before he plants Eden, he formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed life into him. The Lord breathed life into man. He didn't do this with the other animals. He breathed a soul into man, and the man became a living creature. Actually, it says he breathed spirit into man, and the man became a living creature. The thing is, though, the word for creature here is nefesh. This word is literally translated soul. So what we see here concerning man is that we're not living creatures. We are living souls. That right there is what differentiates us, man, between animals and plants. We are living souls. Souls that are now eternal. But it goes on because then after man was formed, he planted the garden and he gives some beautiful imagery as to what the garden looked like. Then the Lord took the man and placed him in the garden and said, once again, for my vegan friends, you may surely eat of every tree that is in the garden. Hmm. And then we see what man's first commandment or command was. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. After that, God brings all the animals to Adam, and Adam names them. Then the Lord makes Eve, because the Lord said it is not good for man to be alone. And Eve was created from Adam. Here's uh, the importance of this account. Eve was not created to be subordinate to Adam. She was created to be a helper for Adam, so that they were helpmates. It is because of sin, as we'll see in Genesis 3, that, that things go awry, um, which we see in Christ as being restored. Eve was created as a helpmate, and we get this beautiful symbolism of marriage here, where a man will leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Which, as Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 makes clear to us, citing this specific verse, um, where he writes, this, is a, this mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So even that verse in Genesis chapter 2 refers to Christ and his church, his people. Because the Son of God left the Father's side to go after his bride, to go after his church. It is beautiful to realize that from the beginning we see God's plan of redemption starting to unfold. It's amazing. That's what you see in chapter 1 and 2 of Genesis. God's plan of redemption starting to unfold. Okay, so I spent a little longer this week than I initially planned to, but I had to walk through this time talking about the reality of, of context and how there are people who teach from a wrong perspective, that they are false teachers under the guise of being followers of Christ. But they aren't the only ones teaching from a false perspective because there are those who are immature in the faith who teach this. They're, they're not qualified to be a teacher, but they're teaching this stuff because of false teachings that they had been told. And what we have to grasp is the whole purpose of the book of Genesis is to show God's people how he started his plan of redemption. 
It goes all the way back to before the creation of everything. It goes back to before the creation of the heavens and the earth. His plan of redemption started there. And Paul makes it clear in his letter to the church in Ephesus, in the opening of the letter where he penned, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption at, to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be blameless before him. Anyone who wants to take and talk about how predestination isn't there doesn't grasp the word of God. The Lamb's Book of Life was written before the creation of the world, and God's plan of redemption is unfolding here. This is why as, as we walk through Genesis, and as you walk through the whole scripture when you're reading it, keep your minds on this. God is at work as he's drawing out those who are his. He's at work as he's drawing out those who are lost and are now found. The little sheep story where Jesus goes after the one. Huh. And in his very word, God is showing us how this is happening. So for the next week, if you're up for the challenge, what I want you to do is read Genesis chapter 3 a few times. And as you're reading it, remember the context. God is showing his people how all of this came to be. God's showing them how he has this plan to redeem those who are his, and it's all coming to fruition. It's amazing when you look at it in the eyes of the Jewish people as they're coming out of Egypt. I mean, have a great week. Peace!